cycles that you guys are responsible for um, is the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the phosphorus cycle. Um, everything actually has a cycle, but this is enough. So um, we did the nitrogen cycle a little bit, and um, now we're going to work on phosphorus today. Um, and the reason we study these cycles is because uh, these are the ones that plants have to have in large quantities or they just can't survive, which means then there's no food for anybody else. So that's kind of why we're study studying these particular ones. Um, I mentioned to you last week about nitrogen. So um, nitrogen is one of those odd ones that people don't even think about, despite the fact that you're breathing it in all the time. So um, if we actually looked at what the atmosphere was made up of, it's 78% nitrogen. Um, all of your protein has a nitrogen base to it, including your DNA and your RNA. And besides that for animals, it's absolutely essential for plants. They won't grow if there's no nitrogen. You can't, you can't even get, get a seed to germinate and make a first leaf if there's no nitrogen. Um, even though that you know that you need protein and that proteins are the building blocks of, of pretty much all the important activities in your cells and for most animals, you cannot access that nitrogen, that 78% nitrogen that's in the air. Uh, animals and most plants can't use that directly. It has to be converted. And so the nitrogen that you are using, you get it by eating other animals, other plants, um, the proteins that are in those, then you assimilate and then you can use that, that nitrogen in the form of protein. Um, so the nitrogen cycle, um, again, most of the nitrogen is in the atmosphere. Um, it, there's, it, it, it has to somehow be switched from N2 gas, which is two molecules of nitrogen. It has to be switched somehow to that into either nitrite or nitrate. And nitrate is NO3 and nitrite is NO2. If we have any chemistry majors in us or, 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 or that are listening and you're trying to figure it out, those are the biological forms that are useful. Um, the nitrogen itself that's there in the, in the atmosphere, only really the bacteria can get access to that. Um, once that gets converted into nitrate or nitrite, then it's a super, super powerful fertilizer and it can really help plants to grow um, really well. Um, I think I showed you this picture. This is a soybean root and those little nodule they, nodules that are there um, were made by the plant. There are bacteria that are inside of those nodules. There's millions of them. And so this is called nitrogen fixation. So the little bacteria that live inside of those nodules are able to take the atmosphere, um, the atmospheric nitrogen, and they can convert it. Um, they can make um, ammonium, um, nitrate, nitrite, and then that's a direct feeding source for, for plants. So legumes can do this. So soybeans, beans, peas, there's legume trees as well, um, like redbud trees that live around here. Uh, they're the only ones who are able to do this. And um, it's only because they have this weird little relationship with this bacteria. Most of the time, plants try really, really hard to keep bacteria out because bacteria, you know, just like with yourself, bacteria can be really harmful. Um, but whenever the plants um, find this bacteria in the soil, they actually invite it in, they build a house for it. Um, they feed sugars, carbohydrates to that, that bacteria. So those bacteria multiply and, and do well. And so that's what's on the, on the root systems of all these different legumes that are out there. Um, the other part of this is um, the bacteria then convert those um, ammonium ions into nitrite and then nitrate. That's what the plants can take up. You can't do this. You don't have a relationship with bacteria like that. So the only way you can get your nitrogen, which is again, the backbone for all your proteins, 
is by eating them. So you have to eat plants or you have to eat animals that have, um, you know, protein in them. Uh, you probably have heard that it's really good for you to eat beans and um, members of the legume family have a really high nitrogen content to them. So that makes their protein really high. So that's why people are always trying to get you to eat those um, because they do have a lot of protein in them. And the last step of this whole cycle is denitrification. And that's where there's another kind of um, bacteria that's in the soil. And it converts the nitrates in the soil or water back to gaseous nitrogen. And that releases it back into the atmosphere. Uh, and then the whole cycle can start over again. So compared to all the other cycles that we've had, we, we haven't talked about like a, a helper, right? The carbon cycle was kind of direct, so was the water cycle. But in this case, bacteria is really responsible for everything that's happening here. Um, that is the nitrogen cycle. I asked you to look at that last week. Um, it takes place on the land. It also takes place in the water. Um, and so, you know, the arrows here, there's arrows going every which way. Um, the other place that where nitrogen, nitrogen can get produced is when lightning happens. So uh, lightning is exceedingly powerful and that can cause, especially if there's a lot of water vapor in the clouds, um, that can cause nitrogen N2 to become NO3 or NO4. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a process. So this is the most complicated of the cycles that we're going to do. So I think you should just spend a little bit of time looking at this, going back over those last two or three slides. And, you know, what is assimilation, right? What is denitrification? Make, sh make sure that you know what those terms act actually mean. Um, so people figured this out right away um, about how sometimes plants grow better in certain soils than they grow in other soils. And so up until very recently, nitrogen really was sort of the bottleneck for producing, for producing plants, for, for growing crops. And either you were on good soil or you weren't on good soil, um, you could add manure. Um, does anybody remember from like when you guys were little and you were studying about the Native Americans and, and the people that, the, the colonists, does anybody remember what the Native Americans showed the colonists how to do when they were planting corn? I bet you all learned this. So put fish on them to fertilize it? Yeah, they would stick, you know, fish heads that were other parts of the fish in at the same time that they would plant the seed. And then that fish would break down um, into fertilizers. There's a lot of nitrogen in, in animals. And then the corn would grow really, really well. And so you can see in this picture, um, the top photo on the left, there's typical corn, we, we all grew up in Ohio, so we know what corn is supposed to look like. Um, and over on the left-hand side, this is in the same field, that side of the field did not get any fertilizer, and that's the way it looks. Sometimes you'll even notice this in your um, neighbors. If you have a, a neighbor who's crazy about their lawn, they might have this really, really, really dark green, emerald green looking grass and your grass doesn't look anything like that, um, they've probably added nitrogen. You know, they've probably fertilized it a couple times a year and, and that's why it looks like this. So um, people figured out about nitrogen and you know, there's a lot of different ways we can fertilize crops. We can use manure, um, we can use um, wastewater treatment, you know, sludge from the wastewater treatment facilities, but all of that's well, one, it's smelly, and two, it's kind of like, you know, tedious to go move that and, and use it. Um, and so what we do now is we buy our fertilizer in bags. Generally, it's, it's sold most of the time as um, uh, granular. Um, there's lots of equipment that makes it really easy to spread that. And um, that's what farmers do. Sometimes they even buy um, ammonia. Um, and they'll, they'll actually put that in their fields as well. 
but all of that's expensive and you have to have you know proper equipment to be able to do that so it works really well for like industrialized agriculture like what we have here with big big tractors and equipment but that does not work if you're in a very very poor country um, I, I, I always wondered when I was growing up, why are all these people starving? Why don't they just grow a garden? You know, because even if you're a bad gardener, you can get some food, but a lot of times the soil is, is impoverished, meaning that there is no nitrogen there or other nutrients. And so they could be the best gardener all day long or farmer, but if they don't have the raw ingredients, including the nitrogen, they aren't going to have a yield. Um, I like that picture from Purdue. It shows you the difference between a small ear of corn and a large ear of corn, how, how much more yield um, you get if you add nitrogen. So generally most of the farmers in our area um, do add nitrogen to their crops. And they also do something called crop rotation, where one year they'll grow one kind of plant and the next year they'll grow corn. Does anybody know what they go back and forth with, what they alternate with around here? Like soybeans, I know that's one. Yep, that's exactly right. And that's because soybeans are those nitrogen fixers. So in the, in the fall, when they pick the, the beans off the soybeans, that's what they're after, are the, uh, are the bean pods, uh, they leave the rest of it there. Um, sometimes they'll go out and they'll even take a small plow and they'll turn the plant underneath the soil. And then all those little nodules that I just showed you are filled with nitrates. And um, then next year when they plant their corn, um, all of that extra nitrogen is already there. So that can cut the cost of fertilizing by, by more than half. And so that's why farmers lots of times rotate back and forth between soybean and corn. I always wondered if anybody wondered that question, why they did that but it, it's to save money. So generally corn um, sells for more than soybeans. So if they had their way, they would probably prefer to grow corn year after year after year, but the soil would be so nutrient poor after a few years of doing that, uh, that they would have to spend all their profits adding extra nitrogen back um, into their to their field. So that's why they, they rotate. And then in our area, it's soybeans, but in other places, it's other kind of legumes. Um, there's, there's many, many kinds of legumes. So they might alternate with, you know, green beans and, and something else. Um, so this is what happens when we screw around with the nitrogen cycle. Um, Remember that there was these bacteria that were denitrifying the soil and there's only so many of them. And so if you add a tremendous amount of extra nitrogen into the system, they can't break it down very quickly. And so we end up with eutrophication. You can see that picture, that poor dead fish. That, that must be a famous fish. It's like all over the internet. Um, also, when you burn, um, when you burn certain things, um, forests, and you burn fossil fuels, um, you end up with getting something called phytochem or photochemical smog, and that's what the picture is on the left-hand side. Um, so that's the exact same view: one one day when it's clear, and one day when it's not. So some of those gases that we release, including the nitrogen gases that, are, that get released from, from, from our industry, will combine with um, the chemicals that are in the air when there's sunlight. So it takes the energy from the sun to kind of trigger that photochemical smog. But if you've ever been to a major city, you've probably seen it um, in, for yourself. Um, I saw it one time when I was, I, my first visit to Las Vegas, we were, we were driving and we um, came in out of the mountains and the entire town of Las Vegas looked like it was in like a yellow brown haze. And it was disgusting looking and um, I couldn't wait to get out of there. But um, photochemical smog, some of that is, is directly tied with the nitrogen cycle, um, just because we're, we're adding so much more nitrogen to the system than, than there ever used to be before. 
Um, so our last cycle we're going to do, and you guys are like, I'm going to be so glad when I get done with these cycles. <laughs> our last one is the phosphorus cycle, and this is the easiest one, everybody. So that's why we save that to the last. Um, phosphorus is the capital P. There is no um, significant amount in the atmosphere. Almost all of phosphorus is tied up in rocks. Um, phosphorus is pretty difficult to um, break down. It takes a lot of weathering to, to do it. Um, when it is broken down and it's not in the form of a rock anymore, the phosphorus is actually just phosphorus, that sometimes can then be taken up by plants. And, and the reason I have sometimes there is because it's, phosphorus is not that water soluble directly. And so um, plants use a little bit of a helper to be able to do that. There's a special fungus that lives in the soil called mycorrhizae, that's the name of it. And by the way, if anybody wants to know the name of the bacteria that the legumes use, that's called rhizobium bacteria, just in case anybody's heard of that before. If you were wondering what was the name of the bacteria, the, the rhizobium is the one that can do nitrogen fixation. Um, mycorrhizae helps plants get their phosphorus. Um, generally, um, it's hard for plants to be able to absorb very much phosphorus. It's considered to be a very limiting factor for plant growth. And um, this mycorrhizae fungus, when it finds a suitable plant that it's, that it's compatible with, the plant does the same thing as that bacteria. It allows that fungus to come in and live on its roots um, the plant actually feeds the, the fungus some uh, carbohydrates to help that fungus grow. And that fungus then sends out jillions of little tiny feeding tubes um, called hyphae all through the soil. And it makes it much easier for the plant then not only to absorb phosphorus, but also to absorb some other nutrients and water as well. So the little um, seedlings that are over there on the left, um, they show this would be one that had been growing without having any um, rhizobium bacteria um, associated with it. This one had rhizobium and all these little yellowish areas that are all over that is the fungus growing on the roots. And these are the same exact kind of plants, same age. They came from the same batch of seeds. And this is a pretty good demonstration to show what happens with, with mycorrhizae and then without. Same thing, here's some woody plants. Um, uh, you know, they're quite a bit older. This one had mycorrhizae um, in the soil and this one did not. And you can see how many more roots that they have on it. Um, why do you care about phosphorus? So phosphorus is a super important um, nutrient for all of your cell membranes. Uh, also, it's in your DNA and RNA too, and it's in lots of other biochemical compounds. Those of you who've had biology before, you might have heard about ATP. Um, ATP is the energy carrier molecule that most animals use, and the P in that is phosphorus. So again, you have to have phosphorus to be uh, alive. First off, you have to have to be able to have it. And again, you can't absorb phosphorus directly. So you have to get it from, from what, what you eat, from the, the plants and the animals that you eat. Um, there's the phosphorus uh, uh, cycle. Um, again, it's pretty easy, right? It's in, it's in the rocks, it's, it's part of the geology. Um, it can either be eroded or we can use, um, this is supposed to show, uh, pretend to be like a little phosphorus mine. So they're out, actually out there mining phosphorus rock and grinding it up. And then it's used in both phosphorus and detergents. Um, so, or sorry, fertilizers and detergents is where we get our phosphorus from. So um, there are land plants that are, that are taking this up. Then the animals like you and I and other animals eat it. And so um, this, is, this is all part of the phosphorus life cycle. And so, um, 
again, you have to have these things, but yet you can't get them. So mother nature provided a way for you to get them. In the case of nitrogen, that's a bacteria. And in the case of phosphorus, it's a fungus, which is kind of cool. Um, so um, a lot of, there, there's been in the past, has anybody ever seen anything looking like this? Has anybody ever been to a pond or a lake or a creek or anything and seen foam on it? Yep. Where at? My house. Really? Yeah. Is that a creek or a pond or what is it? It's like a small creek. Uh huh. Yeah, I've and seen it in creeks during uh, Boy Scout campouts and stuff. That's, that's a surprise. Well, we, we do live in a farm area. Um, so maybe you're seeing the phosphorus run off from the farm. So phosphorus was banned about I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago. You guys are sitting there with your phones. Why don't you Google and find out when phosphorus was banned from household products? See, how, see what year they did that. Um, excuse me. Go ahead, Kat. Um, can I use the restroom? Absolutely. And you guys never need to ask. You can just always step away if you <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to ask. All right, thank you. Sure. So does anybody see when phosphorus was banned in the United States? Uh, yeah. 1994. 1994, okay. I think. okay. Oh no. So up until that point, um, phosphorus was a major ingredient in like all of our soaps. Um, laundry soap, dishwashing soap, um, pretty much any cleaner had phosphorus in it. And that's because um, phosphorus is an amazing cleaner. And so the pictures that you see here were used to be super, super common. Um, every reservoir, um, any, any, any place around, um, especially uh, you know, an agricultural place like Ohio, you would go out and there would be foam everywhere. And, um, you know, this is, this is not right because um, you're basically seeing what happens with phosphorus when it gets in the water. Um, that excess phosphorus um, is one of the contributors for eutrophication. It causes that algae to just grow like crazy. Um, it's, it's the nitrogen as well, but it's both nitrogen and phosphorus that do that. And so they decided that you and I as as you know, just regular household people were stupid and um, would not comply with any rules. And so they took phosphorus all out of all the household products. Um, so right away, there was a lot of complaining. Um, and you know, you guys are too young to remember when this happened, but uh, people like their dishwasher, um, they, they, they just didn't come clean anymore and people's clothes weren't coming clean anymore. And um, there was a lot of public outcry about that. Um, now there's lots of other additives that they put into these cleaners so that our, our dishwashers work again and our, and our laundry comes relatively clean again. But um, I got to say, um, I was part of all of that. And um, I noticed instantly when the phosphorus got taken out, it just nothing worked quite as well as it did. But the idea behind taking the phosphorus out was that we would not have this happening. Um, right now, if you were to go to Lowe's and you were to try to buy a bag of fertilizer that had phosphorus in it, you would not be able to buy it. It's all zero. Um, you can, um, if you're a farmer, you can still buy fertilizer that has phosphorus in it, but local homeowners, um, just individual people cannot buy it. So um, I'm wondering about the people who said that they saw foam in their creeks and their ponds. Um, it, it, if it's after a big heavy rain early in the spring, I can see where that would maybe happen from the farmers, but if it wasn't like that, I really would wonder where that phosphorus is coming from. Because, 
you and I can't buy it anymore. Industry can still use it and the agricultural folks can still use it, but, but we can't use that anymore. There is uh, actually a bug that causes a lot of foam naturally, and it wouldn't be like to that level for the picture on the right, but um, it's the, called the spittle bug and it like oh, produces some foam naturally. Yeah, um, but those are years. like the size of a dime, right? Yeah, but if there is a lot of them, like in their mating season in one specific area, and they are native to uh, Ohio or like anywhere in the US, Sometimes so it, it builds how, up. How much would you possibly see in, in like the size of a basketball at, at once or something like that? Uh, two or three in one, if, they, if it was like really dense in an area. It, yeah. it would not be anywhere close to the picture on the, on the right. Right, right, yeah. right, yeah. So um, usually the foaming stuff would also come where the water was moving and it was kind of agitating, um, you know, like a, a washing machine would agitate water. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's where this, that's where that foam would occur a lot. Um, so um, it, we'll have to, you guys are just glad that you don't, you never had to live through this. So oh, if yeah. I, you know, would go, you want to go swimming at Caesar Creek or go down to the river. This is what mostly rivers and creeks used to look like when I was your age. It was kind of disgusting. And lots of times it wasn't white and fluffy. That foam would get really dirty and nasty looking and it would be everywhere. So um, anyway, I guess it was a good idea to take the phosphorus out, um, but because it did fix a lot of problems. Um, so there are um, ideas about how we can kind of um, keep all of these nutrients from getting into the watersheds in the first place. And some of the recommendations based on what they did in Chesapeake Bay said, um, you know, let's reduce the farm and lawn um, fertilizer applications. And certainly farmers are really careful about it because um, one, it costs them a lot of money. And uh, they certainly don't want to go to the thousands of dollars to put fertilizer on. And then the next day have a big flash flood and it would take take off their fertilizer. So uh, farmers are doing all kinds of things to reduce their applications. They're even using drones to apply the fertilizers. They can um, use um, uh, camera equipment to like look at the different colors of the leaves in the field. And they know if most of the field is all good, but this one little spot needs some fertilizer, they might just fertilize that particular area. And again, they're going to really, really, really watch the weather and make sure that all their hard work isn't going to run right off into the neighboring creek. This picture is something called a vegetation buffer. And so if you can see there's a farmer's field and then there's a little creek and then it goes back to a pond. The idea here is that if you leave plants, especially some woody plants, they are going to be able to capture and absorb a lot of that nitrogen and phosphorus before it ever gets into the water. And so um, locally in Butler County, um, up to a few years ago, they were actually paying farmers to leave a vegetation buffer around their field like this. And if they didn't have one, they would even pay to have one planted for them. And so this is just um, yet another way of, of making sure that those nutrients and, and even the sediments from the field don't end up in the water. Um, improving sewage treatment technology is key. Um, it's gross, but a lot of our sewage, you guys, has ammonia in it, and that's a form of nitrogen. And um, if sewage is not treated, if it's dumped right into um, waterways, um, that can cause eutrophication as well. Um, back in the day, um, cruise ships and ocean ships, including the Navy ships, they would just discharge their sewage right into the ocean. Um, they aren't allowed to do that anymore. There was maybe a 20 plus year grandfathering in of old ships because they didn't have the technology to do anything about it but um, you're not allowed to just dump sewage right into the waterways anymore, hopefully. Um, and lastly, trying to reduce fossil fuel use um, would be great because a lot of the compounds that come out of when we burn fossil fuels 
um, some of that is nitrogen and then it gets um, deposited in, in these places and causes all kinds of problems like eutrophication that we've talked about. So um, this sort of shows um, kind of the overall cost for reducing just nitrogen into the Chesapeake Bay and some of it is really expensive. So you see stormwater there um, and then wastewater treatment facilities. All of that involves a huge amount of infrastructure and it was going to cost an awful lot of money. And so these are in billions of dollars. And again, there were many, many states involved here. And so what most, what, what's worked best um, is to do the inexpensive things. They've, re, they've constructed wetlands and they've restored wetlands. Uh, they've added these forest buffers that I just showed you. Um, they've even put in some grass, grassland buffers to kind of catch some of it. Um, and so all of everything here that's in green is all associated with agriculture. And basically the cost of doing that stuff was way, way less expensive. Um, they have figured out new ways of raising oysters. So that was a completely new practice. And then everything else here um, is going to require a lot of money. But the good news is um, all of these things have been started on. Many of them have been put in place and the oysters are coming back and Chesapeake Bay is not a hypoxic zone anymore, um, which just shows that if you, you know, I don't want to say if you throw enough money at a problem, but if you study a problem and figure it out and, and go back to the sources of where the pollution is coming from, um, that's, that's our best chance to fix it. So um, the bay is pretty clean now. I don't know if anybody's ever vis visited Baltimore and, or any of those other areas where the Chesapeake Bay is, but it's, it's a real pretty place again. So that worked out pretty well. Does anybody have any questions on chapter two? Anything on the study guide you can't find? Yes, no? You all gonna uh, had out of 10? Go ahead. Uh, which, uh, out of all the cycles, which one do you think we've influenced the most? Um, probably the carbon dioxide, the carbon cycle, I'm guessing, just because of how much CO2 is in the air. But next to that one, it would be nitrogen for sure. Um, we've just been dumping, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds of nitrogen into the atmosphere or into the environment. And um, those denitrifying bacteria can only handle